I am happy that once again, you chose to join us in our Bible study. By now, you have figured out that I'm on Thursday instead of Sunday, which works great for me. And you can still listen whenever it works for you. If it works on Sunday, listen on Sunday. If it works on Thursday, listen on Thursday. Whatever day it works, listen on that day. Uh, remember to hit that subscribe, bu subscribe button right here or right there, wherever it is, it's somewhere down there, so that you are notified when there's a new message. Also, by the time you hear this, uh, message, we should have a new president and the first female vice president. Yay! Hopefully and prayerfully, it was a peaceful transition. If not, just know that God is still on the throne and is in control. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we thank you we thank you we thank you we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you as always we love you and we thank you in jesus name amen so we continue with article number 11 the perseverance of saints and our author writes we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And y'all, we're just going to jump right on to the scenic route. Uh, if you missed our recap from last week, uh, reminding us of how we got here, you're going to have to go back and listen uh, on the YouTube channel, which is Mount Sinai, MBC of Memphis Incorporated, and watch uh, and watch it, which by the way, that's where you are now. You're on our Mount Sinai YouTube page. It doesn't matter how you got here. You may have gotten here through GroupMe or Facebook, or you may have gotten here just by clicking on a text message. The important thing is that you are here. So while you're here, look around. After this message, of course, don't you dare look around while I'm still talking. So wait until after the message and then look around. And so for now, as the song says, we are moving on. We're moving on to John, the third chapter, verse 14 on our scenic route. And it says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So Jesus here is referencing an incident from the Old Testament that any teacher of the law or any Jew worth their, worth their salt for would know and would be very familiar with it. It's recorded in Numbers, uh, the chapter 21, and that's where we're going to hang around today. So the Israelites had been traveling through the wilderness, headed for the promised land. It was a desert, which means that it was hot. It was sandy. And it was just rough all the way around. And there was little water. But they had God with them. Which means that no matter how tough the situation was, when they had God with them, they had every single thing that they needed. When they needed it. But like us, when times are tough, when times are rough, they became discouraged. In fact, we are living now in such a time. Y'all, it's been almost a year since we've been dealing with COVID-19. 
we have had approximately and that's just at the time of this recording 94 million cases worldwide and 24 million of those cases are right here in the united states approximately 10 million of those 24 million uh, have recovered which still leaves a whole bunch and then around 400,000 have died and now it's been reported that a new strain is attacking and last I heard it had reached at least 14 states most churches have been closed since March of last year and it looks like they will remain closed for a while yet. We have now, we now have added to our everyday outer apparel a mask that covers our nose and our mouth, which is supposed to cut the spread of the disease, to which some people, for whatever reason, have refused to wear the mask. We have just come out of the holidays where instead of being with our, our families, we were advised to limit our gatherings to the people in our household, our own household. And then, if that is not enough to make you despair and discourage, the capital of the United States of America was just taken over by terrorist groups who literally tore up the place and were allowed to walk around and, 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 and to walk out like they own the place. And if that's not enough, the president of the United States, who's not the president now, but were, was then, uh, was the one who pumped him up to do so. I could go on, but you get the picture. We are living in a time where lots of people, understandably so, are discouraged and frustrated. Now, right about now, I should remind us that our third freedom of declaration that we've been studying is freedom from what? say it with me, discouragement and no frustration. With all of the stuff going on, the question could be asked, where's the freedom? Freedom from discouragement does not mean that there won't be things in our lives that will frustrate us. It means that if we keep our eyes on the promise and the promise maker, he will keep us in perfect peace, in spite of our circumstances. Israel was experiencing life discouraging circumstances. Can you imagine being in the desert? It's hot, it's, it's sandy, the walking is rough, and you have to deal with people, lots of people. Then, to top it off, there's no water. If ever there was a recipe for frustration and discouragement, I'd say that'd be it. The amazing thing about God is that he wants us to know him. Most times, in order for him to get our attention, he has to allow frustrating situations to come into our lives. Every day cannot be sunshine. And he doesn't allow it so that we can get frustrated, but so that we will learn that we can trust his promises. We can trust him. He's a God that, that we can trust. So that we will know that he is he, he wants us to know that he's a very present help in times of trouble. And so that we will know that we can find shelter and rest in him. Psalms 91 and 1 says, 
He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I'll only read that one verse, but it's an excellent psalm to read, especially during times of discouragement and frustrations. Back to Israel. God had promised to be with Israel on their journey and to give them the promised land. But time after time, their faith failed. And they looked at their circumstances instead of their God. Is that not like us? If only they had just focused on the fact that God would continue to lead them and that he would continue to supply their need. They could have encouraged themselves instead of sinking into despair. Think about David. David is a, a he gives us a perfect example of looking uh, away from our circumstances and focusing our eyes on the Lord. In the first, in first Samuel, the 30th chapter, the Amalekites had burned Ziglag, which is where David and his men had left their families and they had left their stuff. And, and the Amalekites had burned down the town, burned it up, and had taken off with all of the people that were there. And in those people included all the women, the children uh, of David, and the men that were with them. And, and so that's a uh, 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 despairing time. The Bible says that David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. You, you know, th those times when you cry so much that you just literally just run out of power. You still want to weep some more, but you just don't even have the strength to do it anymore. Then after weeping, the man got mad. It, it's like the Bible says that they were greatly distressed. Now they wanted to blame somebody for their misery. And that somebody was David. The Bible says that David was greatly distressed. Think about it. Now he's distressed about his family. And added to that distress was the fact that the men talked about stoning him. But here's my point. Instead of going deeper into discouragement and frustration, David took his eyes off the circumstance. He took his eyes off the fact that his wife, his children, his stuff, all that stuff was gone. He took his eyes off the fact that these men wanted to stone him to death. And David found strength. He, he was encouraged in the Lord. Because when you look at, when your focus is on the Lord, it renews your strength. The Israelites did none of that. Instead, when, when there was no water and, and the desert was hot, you know, that's what a desert is. It's hot. What they did was spoke against God and Moses. And, and they said, I, I mean, when you're discouraged, when you are tired, when you are hot, that's a good time to zip your lips. Because they got the talking and they got the saying stuff that really was not good. They said stuff like, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? There's no food, there's no water, and our souls loathe this worthless bread. Wow. Can you imagine? God had been providing and they are saying what God was giving them they loathe it. Does that sound familiar? Talk about being, first of all, bold, then foolish, and finally, just downright ungrateful. So for this insurrection, God was swift to punish. He immediately sent fiery serpents among the people. 
their venom was deadly and the people began to die. This time, unlike other times, the punishment was swift and to the point. The people were used to sinning, you know, they, that's all they were doing, you know. They sinned, then they begged for forgiveness, then they sinned again, they begged for forgiveness. So they were used to sinning. And, and then Mo, what would happen is they would sin, and then Moses would throw himself between God and the people, and, and Moses would pray for God to have mercy. But this time, God wasn't having it. He just was not having it. This time. Instead of Moses going to God for the people, the people came to Moses and confessed their sin against God and against Moses. And, and then the people begged Moses to pray to God to take away the serpents. The snake bites were exactly what they needed. Wow, can you imagine that all of the 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 hardship and the despair and the troubles and the whatever it is that causes us to take our eyes off of God and, 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 and complain. Whatever situation we're in that causes us to run to God is exactly what we need. And, and so the snake bites were exactly what was needed to bring them to a place of conviction. And, and then they were ready to beg for forgiveness. Y'all, God knows how to deal with sin. God's judgment shows that he is close. He, he's not far away. That God is not far away, uh, a far away God that is not paying attention to what's going on. Not only is he close to the situation in the whole wide world, so nothing escapes God. He's close to the situation but he's also close to the situation in my little world. God's judgment also shows that he is in control. Nothing gets by God. Nothing escapes God. You can fool your mama. You can fool those around you, but you cannot fool God. You're not getting away. You, you may be, as, as the old folks used to say, you may get by for a little while, but you're not getting away with anything. And then God's judgment shows that he is supervising. He's the director. He's the manager. For every act for or against us, God must give his approval. And then God's judgment shows that he is active. He's involved. He's not passive. He is participating. He knows how much we can bear. He, he's not going to let anything come upon us that, that just going just gonna to wipe us out. He, he's not going to do that. And, and finally, God's judgment shows that God knows what to do. God's righteous judgment is perfectly just and it's perfectly tempered. God's judgment is wisely administered with precision and perfect timing to get the results that he desires. And, and most of all, God's judgment is motivated by love because he loves us. So when Moses prayed to God for the people, God didn't remove the judgment. He gave a remedy. God instructed Moses to make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who was bitten, when he looked at it, he shall live. Then the Bible says that Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, serpent he lived. I read a quote that said, the quote said, to look around is to be distressed. To look within is to be depressed. To look up is to be blessed. God was teaching the people something about faith. The bronze serpent, it, it, it's not what saved them. 
Only God pro could provide the remedy for their sin. But it took an act of faith in God's plan for anyone to be healed. In looking to the brazen serpent on the pole, there, they were looking with faith, believing that because God said it, they could look up and be healed. True saving faith does not look to religion. It, it does not look to statues or humans or anything. It looks to God as the only one who can rescue us. Our There's nothing else that can rescue us. Our, our friends, our spouses, our parents, people with money, people with no money, none of these things can rescue us. None of these things can can give us a remedy for what ails us. A, a paragraph from a devotion, uh, devotional that I read, it, it says, today our way may be through the wilderness. It may be easy to become discouraged. Discouragement is a tool of Satan's. The story is told that Satan was going out of business. All of his tools were offered for sale. They were attractively displayed on a table. What an array of, of tools he had. H hatred, envy, jealousy, deceit. One harmless looking one, much worn, was priced higher than any of the others. What is that tool? Someone asked. Discouragement was the, was the reply. Why is that so expensive? Satan answered, because it is more useful to me than any of the others. In other words, you get us discouraged. We won't do anything. <clears throat> we just go downhill. I will end with a question. Will our distress drive us to despair and discouragement? Or will it drive us to God? <coughs> Excuse me. He is the remedy to whatever ails us. Look up and live.